the beginnings of mass strikes. So first of all, the textile workers' strike, 400,000 workers across 20 states, uniting black and work, white workers. Of so perhaps the biggest uh, strike movement that had occurred in America since 1877. The strike was actually defeated, but which, which showed that it was possible for workers to fight back. And then on the back of that, the San Francisco a general strike, beginning with a strike amongst dockers, but then spreading to 150,000 other workers involving laundry workers, barbers, restaurant workers, as well as more uh, core sections of the working class. A, a huge movement, which actually won union rights. In Toledo, the auto workers' strike, where both employed workers and unemployed workers coming together to fight for eight days against the National Guard, which had artillery and machine guns, and defeating the National Guard and winning union rights in the Toledo auto factories. And of the Teamster Rebellion in Minneapolis, where a strike led in part by Trotskyists, which uh, defied martial law and defeated uh, the movement uh, of, of, of the governor to attempt to drown in blood the, the strike. Now, those strikes then led to an even higher level of the sit-down strikes of 1936, beginning in General Motors in Cleveland, and then in 1937, 477 sit-down sit strike occupations of factories by American workers, and laying the basis of what could have been a Labour Party in the United States. Now, why that's important is not to say that any of that was inevitable, but it certainly cuts against the notion that it's impossible for workers to strike during a recession, or to think that there isn't something that's possible that can happen again in society uh, as we are now. And in Britain, you also see some interesting developments. And remember, if you're thinking about the political background to Britain, Britain has seen the general strike, the betrayal of the general strike by the trade union leadership, and an appalling defeat for the working class even before the recession came. If you think it's hard now, imagine that three years ago we'd had a general strike which had been absolutely hammered and broken by the betrayal of the union leaders, all the militants chucked out of the factories, and of a huge, raging uh, depression inside society. That's quite a difficult situation to organise in. And yet there was significant movements, not only the unemployed riots of Birkenhead and London and so on in, in 1931, but also you see the beginnings <coughs> of quite important unofficial strikes, the Chronopia miners, for example, uh, detonating a big strike in the South Wales Mines. You see movements amongst uh, iron and steel trades workers, amongst engineers, amongst other groups of workers. And on the back of that, when again there was a slight upturn in society, the first attempts and the first wave of organisation in the car plants, press steel, fisher and so on, uh, in the, the Midlands and the home counties, places which had never been organised before. Now, why these are important is because we have to cut against this notion that what happened in the 1930s and what later happened in periods was simply a desert of working class organisation. What mattered in all of these cases was a combination of both economic bitterness about society, that sense of class bitterness, that our class is being aid, made to pay the price <coughs> through our jobs, through our conditions, through our housing, through our livelihoods, for the problems of a system which is not our system and not the that we've ever benefited, benefited from, nor one that we control. That bitterness inside society, combined with something else, which is about the political organisation of people at the centre of it. So that if you look at many of the examples I've spoken about in the 1930s, you will find the Communist Party at the centre of those. And if not the Communist Party, of people further to left, the Trotskyists and other groupings. Not that, you know, we haven't time to go through all the very many problems with the Communist Party, but there were people who in some ways enshrined a different way of relating to society than that of the Labour Party or of those who said simply we should cooperate with the bosses. And this is important. The combination of spontaneity and of political organisation inside the working class. And not simply organisation at the point of production, not simply trade unions, but actually politics as well. If you look at... The 1930s, the, the fight back against the restrictions on benefit, for example. The great example, no one knows about these because they're not talked about, because they're much too dangerous for the ruling class. But if you look at, for example, in the Great Rebellion in 1935 and 1936 in South Wales, amongst people who marched against the benefit offices and laid them waste, destroyed them, actually pulled them down 
against the benefit restrictions that took place, what you find about them is the combination of unemployed workers, yes, and yes, the Communist Party, but also not simply about the, the immediate economic question. Of course, the economic questions were important. People had, were going barefoot because of the poverty. People were dying at levels, the level of uh, death in Merthyr in 1935 of child uh, mortality was 212 per thousand. That's about the level of the worst level of sub-Saharan Africa now. Now, of course, that all mattered. You look at the propaganda, though, and it's about the Spanish Civil War about the unity with French workers and Spanish workers fighting back. It's not simply about the point of production or the economic conditions. It's also about a much bigger political vision, simply, than that. And if you look at the 1980s in Britain, which again people think of the 1980s, Thatcher, Thatcher came in, broke the unions, no one fought. It's not true. Of course Thatcher did win crucial set-piece battles. But there were massive demonstrations, protests and strikes in the 1980s. Everyone knows about the Great Miners' Strike from 1984 to 1985, a year-long strike of miners supported by large sections of the working class, betrayed by the other trade union leaders and by the Labour Party and so on. Not an inevitable defeat, but a defeat that came from political factors. But also think earlier than that, when Thatcher came in in 79 and was determined to break the unions, to allow unemployment to rise, to allow manufacturing industry in large swathes, to be closed down in order to break the power of the working class. There were huge demonstrations against unemployment, led by the Labour Party, it's true, but, you know, of tens of hundreds of thousands of workers who marched against unemployment. There were big strikes, the steel workers' strike, 13-week strike, all out, uh, in 1980, <coughs> which, although it was eventually defeated, there was no reason why it should have been defeated. Certainly workers themselves were prepared to struggle. In 1981, the great victorious miners' strike, where <coughs> Thatcher moved too early against the miners, but was defeated by unofficial action first in South Wales and then in Kent and Yorkshire and parts of Scotland, that the potential for the working class to fight was extremely strong. And these lessons are very, very important for when we think about the present period, because it should show us that without being complacent, without in any way thinking that it's inevitable there's going to be a very high level of struggle, that the potential there <clears throat> is important. You see, I think there's an immense premium on political leadership inside the working class at the moment. The PCS and the NUT examples are very powerful examples. Because here you have left-led unions, people who should have been at the forefront, not simply of thinking, you see, sometimes people can get caught up in these arguments in a very narrow way. The PCS question is about quite how much of the cap is being lifted on the DWP in year two of the pay deal. That's really what it's about. Of course, that's not really what it's about. What it's really about is a much more general question about whether there is going to be resistance by the working class and whether someone's going to head up that resistance by the working class. Because what we do know is there's a very generalised bitterness inside society. What it requires is a focus and a movement, and something to organise around for people. And therefore, the burden, the responsibility of anyone who's in such a position, whether it's at the shop steward level, whether it's in a community campaign, whether it's an anti-war campaign, whatever, or it's on the executive of a, of a union, is to think about whether you are giving a focus to that struggle from below, and whether some group of workers is going to head up the resistance inside society. And one of the things that proves the importance of political leadership is if you look at most of the votes in trade unions at the moment, they are extremely close. Extremely close. Unison Local Government, 55% for a strike. NUT, 52% for a strike. PCS, 54% for a strike. Now, there's a one coming up in the postal workers. They've just voted. Don't worry, you can stay in. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm used to it. Um, the, the, it in the postal workers, we're not meant to know this, but I'll tell you this, this secret. The ballots are just out inside the postal workers. In Merseyside, in the, uh, the, the mail centre there, the vote was 217 for strike, 216 against. One vote inside. Now, they will be on strike, probably, as a result of that. Now, don't tell me that you can just read that off economic circumstances whether people were prepared to strike or not. In Manchester, the strike went down by three 
Three votes, which means that Manchester won. Yeah, I can see Amy cringing there. Did you put enough belief in there? Um, you know, that's the reality of the situation. That's not.